Okay, so marriage and mental illness. What, we got a question the other day about this. This isn't merch, but our sticker is. If you want a sticker, just like in the comments and tell us and we'll give you one. Yeah. We'll do that. No worries at all. Um, today, I want to, we don't normally structure it this way, but I want to ask a question which I'm hoping will lead to uh, um, a fairly good conversation, one that I'm scared of having, uh, which is... No, we put this one off. We put this one off <laughs> well, because yeah. it is a really difficult topic and... I think I've I've equally put it off as, as much as you, Hank, because it's a hard one to answer, isn't it? It is. So let's um the question is when do you leave? Or how long do you stay for? How long do you persist? How long do you persist? When you're living with a person with mental illness, I'll let you what's it like? I mean, what challenges do you face? Sure. Um, if firstly, if no one's actually listened to, because we've covered a lot of that content in some of our other chit chats, mm. so by all means, get on and have a look at those ones as well. Marriage and, and mental illness. Marriage yep. and mental illness. We've got um, a whole series running. I'll put the link here, and I'll also put it in the comments down there. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so we'll dive into it. I'm. Uh, I want to first of all I'll say I'm really nervous whenever it comes to having this conversation. Um, more because of the shame and guilt that's going to well up in me when I hear Meredith's story. Because my understanding of caring for somebody with a mental illness is caring for our kids. And we mm -hmm. share that burden. So immediately, half of the burden that I have as a carer is already gone. Whereas when Mary was first, um, when I was first uh, injured and diagnosed with CP, CPTSD, she was by herself. She had nobody that she could rely on. So I want to just put it to you straight. At what point do you leave? At what point does caring for your loved one with mental illness get too much? And it's a hard question because you never did leave. I didn't. I stayed. So um, talk me through that. Were you, what, what were the main differences? I come home, I've got a mental illness. What's changed? Everything has changed. Mm -hmm. You're a different person. Yep. You come across as a different person. Um, you're often angry. All your interactions are different because yeah, you don't because know how they're going to respond to something. That's right. And sometimes you can't interact for for days. Mm -hmm. Well, I, f I found this with our daughters that um, I hesitate when I interact with them because I don't know what their response is going to be. I don't know how mad they're going to be, how they're going to interpret my interaction with them. Yeah, and a lot of things have to be trial and error to a certain degree. They have to be mm -hmm. because everyone is different, we're all individuals, and also how people handle their mental health and how they interpret the world around them is different for each person depending on what the actual – or how they're diagnosed. What are you suffering from? So for me with PTSD, it came from a critical incident in my workplace, and that turned out to be um, – it was the straw that broke the camel's back. I was going to break down at some stage because of the pressure of my work. It was just when and how. And it happened to be in a critical incident. And overnight, my personality changed and the worst parts of me became the forefront. And I found that with my kids, our kids, watching them, the worst possible parts of their personality seem to be who they are now. I don't know that I would actually say it like that. I, okay, it's, no, it's, it's a good. part. It's a part of them. Yeah. But it's not who they are. 
it doesn't define them as a person. Oh, I'm not. I'm not saying that it does. I, I'm saying that the perception of who they are, what what you see on the outside, mm. without digging deeper, is the worst of them. Oh, so yeah, for yeah. Our, our youngest, she got quiet and then got infinitely quiet mm. and then never smiled and then seemed to start to frown more. And while they weren't the worst parts of her personality, they were the parts that we were trying to mentor her through. Mm. Yeah. So, okay. all right, well, let me put it to you again. When, What could I have done that would have made you leave in our mental health journey? I think for us what the most important thing was is that you wanted to get better. Mm-hmm that you were going to try and get better. I think when you have someone who is sad, depressed, angry, every day, all day, it's exhausting. It's exhausting to to interact with them. It is just too difficult. It really, really is because you no longer either have a partner or a friend or someone who you can rely on. It's just an angry person in your life. Who you're trying to fit into everything else that you have to do. Okay, so what what could I have done that would have made you leave? What, and we'll talk about the reasons that you stayed. But in a worst case scenario, what would have been things that I could have done where you would have said that's enough? Had you just stayed exactly the same? So I think leading up to a real monumental change for you. You were just angry 24 7, um, or you would be quiet. I couldn't talk to you about anything at all. Mm. Uh, you would retreat quite a lot, and you'd just be sad. So, sad, angry, retreating, not able to talk to you. So, you're just almost just like this person that existed in the house with us, but you weren't really there. Either. Okay, so that's one thing that I could have not done is tried to get beyond that and recognize that and acknowledge that um what if i had been violent what if i had a blade of hand on me i think if you're dealing with violence again i i don't think you can stay there you didn't you never laid a hand on me i think that's really important for people to know (laughs) and that's what i'm saying like i'm trying to understand in your mind because like let's take our kids I cannot not care for my kids. Mm. So whatever they do, whatever their behaviours are, it doesn't matter because they're still my kids. But you are different in that you choose to stay with me every day. You you have a choice. The door is open. Um, you know, you could leave at any time. So uh, with you... It's, I mean, even I would have, I I think I could have guessed what I could have done that would have made you leave. I I would have been afraid to touch you uh, in violence or anger uh, for two reasons. One, I don't think you'd ever forgive me. Uh, And two, well, actually, there's a whole bunch. Two would be that um, it would be almost... Well, I wouldn't be able to live with myself mm. if I had have done that. Mm. Uh, it would be almost irreparable. Uh, and I think it would probably be the worst sin that I could commit against my dad. You know, I mean... You'd have to explain that. I don't know what that means exactly. Well, dad would just be so disappointed in me. Mm, okay. Because yeah. he spent my entire life teaching me to respect well, mum mm. and my sister and the women around me. Um, I don't know that I could face my father and have to admit to him that I'd been violent to you. Mm. But But for me, 
violence in 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 whatever form it takes i mean if it's self immolation that you're after that's a different thing you're cutting yourself you're hurting yourself trying to kill yourself but as soon as that violence becomes directed at people i think that that is um that's a deal breaker mm. i have to say though if you had been violent i wouldn't have stayed because mm. i have to consider myself and and our kids mm -hmm. i think no matter what violence is never okay in any situation and i don't believe that anyone should stay in that situation but what if i threat. but what if i'm bipolar does that excuse it absolutely not no, no. I no agree. you can't you can't live that way i agree you cannot live that way and you would be constantly afraid that things were going to happen or you were going to say something that would escalate a situation to that point so just under no no circumstance um would i ever recommend to a friend or just even a stranger to stay in that situation i just couldn't and i think the best thing would be is to back out under violence that is i'm talking about physical violence yep um until such time as you can be safe and also the person who's suffering is not putting them in a situation to hurt another person as well well i come back to it's almost a deal breaker because i don't really understand how you could come back from that. there's no way that you can apologize enough there's no way that um the the only way that i can see a reconciliation would be if the person worked on themselves so completely that they were for all intents and purposes um a new person mm. look that would be down the track and many sessions but just no it's it's a it's a hard pass for me and i i would have left yeah. absolutely but the other thing that i want to tell you oh. with absolute certainty if that had happened i would have gone and grabbed that wooden bat and slammed you with it Oh, yeah. I know oh. that's a terrible thing to say. No, no. Oh. But if if I had been hurt physically, I would do that. Yeah, you'd defend yourself. Oh yes. Or I would wait yeah. till I'm asleep. I'd, I'd, <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is actually possible. I am a planner. <laughs> well, the the other thing about that as well, and I think it's been to our betterment, is the fact that I don't drink. And I don't take illicit drugs. Mm. I think that that is also another thing that people assume. Oh, if they have a drink every now and then and they get a bit rough, you can just live with it. But escaping from your problems, I think. So let's take for one of our daughters. If they just became a raging alcoholic, which is possible because it's in the Brosnan irish catholic genes um i i would still love her i would still care for her i would still make sure she is safe but i wouldn't be able to interact with her i don't think because she's not trying to do anything to improve herself because hmm. i think that was and a big part for you you said at the beginning the fact that you knew that I desperately wanted to change. I desperately wanted to be yes. different. After after a very long, long battle, yes, you did want to change. Um, and it was because of that and because you made promises that things would change. Did I? You did. Not you that. wouldn't remember that. No, I, um, I don't at all. Because it can't... What, Basically, what happened is it came to that sort of crux, that moment in time when it was the possible worst moment for you. Yep. Okay. And I actually came to see you in hospital. Oh, this is after my attempt. Yes. Yep. That's right. Yep. Well, that's what it was. It was that was that was the the real wake up moment for you. You think that was my worst moment? Yes. 
but it was also the wake up moment wasn't it that's right yeah. so I, I then came to see you in hospital um i was actually very very upset oh extremely upset no i could tell it was hard to come and see you yeah but like yes it was really? hard to come and see it was hard to come and see you because um were you mad at me disappointed maybe angry and be honest i think it was a mix of emotions and yeah because i didn't know what to do yeah um the last time that i'd seen you you were in a complete um state a state of what like i i, I believe that i was in a complete rage i, I yes, was i was yeah. having this psychotic episode yeah absolutely um i was out of my mind with that's fear, right and you just anger. left the house and you weren't going to listen to me and you just kept talking about walking out of the house talking about that you're going to end your own life yeah and there was nothing i can do i had three kids back at the house yeah actually in the bathtub at the time were they yes they were they're having a great time actually just so you know um and i just remember walking back into the house and just not knowing what to do i was i was angry at you but I was upset and not knowing what to do. What was I going to do in that situation? I had to stay with our kids, of course. Had to stay with them. Um, yeah, I just – and I knew that I couldn't go back to that. I couldn't go back to knowing that you would keep having psychotic episodes potentially or even that you would be – angry with me every day not able to talk to me every day i just I couldn't live that way i mm. knew i couldn't live that way so when i came to see you at the hospital um i pretty much said those things to you in saying that i couldn't keep going if yes. that was the way it was going to be yeah i don't know if you actually remember i i remember it going to its worst possible result when the psychologist said mark you can't go home she doesn't want you at home and i think i turned to you and i said is, it, is that true yeah. and and you instantly went no he said i didn't say that i didn't say that i yeah, was I remember, just mortified I recall you that because i never actually said that i didn't want you at home mm. that wasn't my words mm. my words were that I didn't want you back in the same place. If you weren't safe, and I know, I don't think that I ever felt unsafe, but if you were going to remain in that place mm. and be unsafe, I didn't want you back at the house in that in that way. Yeah, no, and I wanted enough. them to help you. Yeah. But that wasn't the case. That wasn't ever what they were going to do. Um, but are you okay? Yeah, no, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> This is just great to hear about yourself. <laughs> I'm such a good person. Oh, I love you. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, if we, if our marriage was to survive, we had to have a hundred percent complete honesty in all things, mm. and that extends to joint bank accounts. You have all of my passwords to all of my everything devices social medias i think that that unbridled honesty is probably what kept us together um and a belief that i wanted to change which which is yes. the most difficult thing that i see in our daughters is when it doesn't look like they want to get better it's mm. like they're enjoying their misery and it's easier to just be lazy and go you know what i'm mentally ill so sometimes i'm grumpy and sometimes i cry all the time so but you just deal with it because i've got a mental illness what do they say that depression is a bit like a can be a bit like a, a cozy blanket that you put on because it's so familiar oh yeah I, I guess yeah i wouldn't describe it like that because for me it's very claustrophobic okay it, i think for some people though they 
because they recognize it and they know it so well it's easier to have that yeah. depression on you yeah no than I could, to not have it on you yeah i couldn't think of it as a cozy blanket i, I feel like i'm in the bottom of a well if mm. that makes sense to you but sometimes Do, you understand the bottom of the well better than you understand being out of the well yeah but i never i never saw it as a security blanket sort of thing but i can see how one of our kids does i can see that it's 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 a it's a place that she's comfortable in now mm. and she doesn't have to challenge herself she doesn't have to face her fears she just has to deal with doing nothing mm. and at the time that seems like a viable option and i can see also that it's easier to blame your mental health for all things that are going wrong in your life absolutely and at, at times that is very very real because it impacts on everything that you mm. want to do and then feel incapable to do because your mind's just fighting you on every point mm. um so i can i can get that mm. but you can't live with it you can't inflict that constantly on another person and expect them to also be okay and come out the other side of it okay yeah because i think of it uh, you know that i view my illness in two ways a very clinical way from my career before i was hurt mm. in behavior modification yeah. sometimes i'm able to switch off and i'm able to look at it clinically um and with that kind of understanding I think that when that critical mind could come out and could start saying, okay, what do I have control over? What choices can I make? And I think that was a big part of when I first got hurt. It's the first big part of anybody that's just found out they've got a mental illness is learning the language to describe what they're going through. Um, how do you feel today? Mad. Well, what does that mean? Well, I feel mad. At, uh, what? At everything <laughs> <laughs> but it but it's it's like what are you mad at uh, am i mad at the situation am i mad at my own uh inability to be what i want to be am i mad at a person um if i am mad if i just wake up feeling angry um do i go through my normal routine mm. or do i pull the plug and go it is not safe for me to be out and about today because of x mm, or yeah. y um and i i worry about people that talk to me about their mental illness sometimes that seem to be that do see it as like like you said a, a warm blanket around them that protects them they've got no responsibilities they've got no consequences um they're in the worst place that they could possibly be so why not just lie in it you mm. know um because getting better is hard it's a lot of it's, it is a lot of work but it's a lot of work for for everyone so mm. the person who's supporting them um to the person who has to go and do all the sessions and do all the hard work and put all the strategies in place but you know honestly had you not had your wake up moment i wouldn't have stayed because i could not have done that yeah for myself mm. and my own eventual mental health yep and for our kids i wouldn't i wouldn't have stayed yeah because i don't think you can um just to give that was quite a number of years in that would have been what around seven eight years when you had that moment oh uh, i well it's been 10 years since pop died it's been about 12 years in total that you've been suffering i think well it's closer to 15. okay so i think that was about five years in. somewhere around there yeah. um so yes i did stick in there for a long time prior to the sort of wake up moment for you yeah was there anything do you think that is exceptional about you like we have friends who's marriages have devolved over less i don't um, think so 
You don't think no, there was no, any... I don't see anything. I'm going to say that anyway, but I honestly don't see anything remarkable about myself and different. Um, do you see? Any... I do honestly think that at times, not not in all situations, but I do think that sometimes people give up too soon and aren't willing to put in the hard work. Huh. But at the same time, I say this in knowing how hard it is to live with someone with with mental health issues. Yeah. And I look back on it and perhaps there's some things I could have done better. Yeah. Do you think there was anything special about our marriage? Was there anything special about our relationship, do you think? Like looking back on it now. And, well, I, think, and, uh, I think we've always been close. That's well, we've always been best friends. Yeah, and that and that's and that was the thing at most times that I think did keep me going is knowing the person who who you are because mm. I I know you and I didn't recognize the other person who you became. Yeah, and I think I lived in in that hope each day that that other person would return. Yeah, and come back. So if if I was to ask you to list, you clearly had requirements. That, like staying wasn't unconditional. Like you weren't, you weren't going to stay no matter what. You, you clearly came to a point where you realised that this is out of control. Hmm. If you put it in a checklist... For people, if you were th if you were thinking, okay, these are the things that I need you to not be doing, and you've already partially done it. You said I need you to stop being angry. I need you to stop being distant. I need you to start being stop being absent. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd add to that list? I need you to be actively working on your mental health, working on your strategies, putting them in place, taking your medication if you're given medication. Yep. Um, at times, you kept forgetting your medication, which was a little frustrating to me because you needed it. Mm. You needed this to help you to get in the headspace to be able to put the strategies in place. It's like a big circle. You've got to keep going. We keep going around. You have to have all of these things together. Um, and if you need it, going and talking to someone so that they can help you put things into place in your mind so it makes more sense to give you even more space to be able to get better and yeah. at a place where you feel more even I don't believe that anyone truly gets better or is cured oh yeah no from mental health yeah you, you either have it or you don't but how severely you continue to struggle with it is another is different mm. and that then all comes back down to um, your medication and again how going to treatment and how much you work on it yourself and had you not been committed to that process which you were mm. I couldn't have stayed and let's be clear on this I, I if you had have left at no point would I have ever blamed you or said it's her fault she didn't understand I I knew eventually that I was not a nice person to live with. <laughs> I think the other part that I I think is important for you to know is at the back of my mind, making that call, I was really concerned about you being safe if I left yeah. and making bad decisions where that you would probably end your life if I didn't stay there. But... I don't think that a person can stay in a relationship like that just under the threat of the person saying that they'll end their life if they leave. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess that's the thing. When you think of it like that, you think of a person that if, 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 if somebody was to say that to me, I would assume that they aren't seeing our relationship clearly mm. and it's it, it it is a form of abuse if you don't love me i'll kill myself i mean um it's like financial abuse 
we have somebody close to us that was living in a situation where they were not allowed to spend any money uh, without an explanation. And it was his money. And he didn't understand that it was actually domestic violence by him by the relationship being conditional on if you know we're only going to be happy if you do x y and z um now i think if you're in a healthy relationship where you're both healthy people if people are saying that it's not a healthy relationship mm. um yeah I, I would be really concerned if somebody that i was caring for said that because they're alive for the wrong reasons. But a lot of but a lot of people who are suffering do do that. They say, um, if you don't stay or if you don't do these things for me, mm -hmm. then. Did I ever say anything like that? No, 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 you didn't. Hmm. But it did cross my mind that maybe if I said it point blank to you. So if I said to you, mm -hmm. I'm going to leave. Mm -hmm. That it, maybe it, it might, might have put been a you, trigger. It might put you in a place where you would say something to me that you didn't mean like that. Right. Okay. Okay. It's not. It's not that. It's not that mental health is a logical thing. It's not. Mm. And if you're upset, um, and you have a mental health condition, you will say things that you don't mean yeah. often and regularly. <laughs> <laughs> so but you, you mentioned a checklist before um honestly all those other things about anger and such um i don't actually think are on my list i think that if the person is seriously working on their mental health taking their medications and getting treatment the rest will fall into place as long as they're committed to that process they must be committed to the process it's the most important thing if they're not they'll just let all of the habits slip back in um they will get lazy and they'll also just say it's just too hard and it is it is hard but to say it's too hard for the other people who are loving you and caring for you and want you in your life you know i i think they're worth it they're worth putting that effort in to keep them with you the person that you're caring for yeah it's it's worth it Mm. to have them by your side to help you and support you mm. do you think if the roles had been reversed do you think i would have i mean i think i i would have acted like you i think i think so um i, hope I, so. I have actually had moments where i have not been good yeah well, that, that's the other side, and I was going to ask you about this, is you've got to take care of your mental health as a carer. Absolutely. I think a lot yeah. of carers don't do that. So my psych um, would continually say, how is your wife? And she or they, the, the two of them that we did the most work with, would do one-on-one -on -one sessions with you and just how's it going mm. i mean quite frankly they were just vent sessions they really were they were just but that's probably what you needed for like 45 minutes <laughs> but that's probably what you needed eh? probably i can't say it's certain for me that i feel any better when i came out i probably feel a little more frustrated <laughs> because saying it out loud and it being real and those thoughts being real out loud can can also be difficult because yeah, you're... it makes it all worse yeah it... it's like going into a session yeah i don't want to dredge up all this crap because it's going to make me feel bad but dredging it up is part of the process of getting better that's from. right it is okay so I, I don't know it's i want to come up with a a simple formula of what time do you leave at what stage what what would happen that is the point where you need to get out and i i think it is the extreme i, I do think it is the violence 
Um, so for let's look at the people that were caring for it. If it if it did become physically violent, even though I'm not physically afraid of them, it would still be too much, I think. It would. Yeah, I mean, tricky one because you're talking about we're actually talking about children in, in that in that case, and and we can talk about that on another on another Mark and Mary chat. Yeah, oh, it's just that's the only experience I have as a mental health carer, um, having been a, a sufferer. To be then a carer has just awakened me to the sacrifices that you made and the challenges that you faced. And I think um, if if I could break it down, I think it would be the violence is not the behaviour that you've got to be concerned about. It's the violence is a symptom of a much deeper problem. And I think domestic violence often comes down to blaming the other person. It's very much saying, this is not my fault. Everything that's wrong with me is your fault. And I think if you're living with a person with mental illness that was blaming you constantly, this is your fault. Why are you, why, 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 why do you make me be like this? And I think that is the big part of it. It's that intention. What what is the person doing? Because I'm thinking of somebody that's listening, going, "Oh well, you know, I've, my boyfriend is he he's quite um, he's got a mental illness, say, but I love him. But at what point do we pull the plug when they're not willing to get any better? Surely, when uh, someone was first with someone, there was a point in time at which they they were the person who you fell in love with. And there's a reason why you're with them in the first place. So what changed? What behaviours are they doing now that makes it intolerable to live with? Are they that different person where they're quiet all the time and angry and <coughs> sad? Um, if the person's not willing to try and make effort to get better, I don't think you can stay with them. Because you can't make someone do something that they don't want to do. Yeah. It doesn't matter how fantastic your intentions are. If they don't want to participate, then they won't. And that's even the same with children. If kids honestly put the foot down and are not going to do it, you cannot make them do it, particularly in mental health situations. Yeah. They, they have to want to participate. And if you have a person in your life who's not willing to participate. Um, so in, in their own self-care. In, in their, yes, in, in wanting to be better, then how can you stay in the situation? Yeah. Um, I actually know of a story of a couple, um, older, much older couple, and in later life the husband actually ended up with mental health issues mm -hmm. and it went on for years. But he, he, I believe he was diagnosed and he was given medication, but he just chose that he would not ever take his medication. Right. He wouldn't take it. Yep. And the foot was down. Um, his behaviours were mean and angry all the time. Yep. And I don't know exactly how many years down the track, but I know that the wife made the decision to leave him. Yep. On, and... Perhaps he's still sitting there to this day wondering why she left and not understanding that. But I and I totally get it. Yeah. And I think that's fair. I, I liked the way that you communicated to me that my behaviour was unacceptable. It was by sitting down with professional mental health people, mental health professionals, and allowing them to mediate between us, even if they got the complete wrong end of the stick. And she yeah. gave me a heart attack when she said, your wife doesn't want you to go home. Yeah, where can, under the bus there. Yeah, where no. can you stay tonight? And I was like, I don't know. 
I don't have any friends. I don't have any family. I guess I'm sleeping under a bridge. I, I don't know. And, and it contradicted what you had said to me in the room um, before they'd come in. So I was, I think we were both really gobsmacked by that. But I think it was a worthwhile exercise. It was part of that awakening for me. Mm. Even, even if they gave the worst case scenario in the worst possible way. And don't forget, there's bad psychologists and psychiatrists. We tend to assume that they're professionals, so they do a good job. Nope. Some are good. Some are bad. Some are terrible. Some are fantastic. And we've had the pleasure to meet both. But I think that saying it in a clinical situation was a good way to assist in me fully comprehending. Mm. So, so on the mental health boards, we hear these people saying, oh, I, I care for this person, but they won't change. They won't do anything. What do I do? And it's like, well, have you tried to sit in on some of their sessions? Have you tried to communicate with them? through their mental health care professional because often because i saw you at times as attacking me that when i was in with the psychologist and i knew that she was completely impartial and she would explain to me no your wife is not attacking you this is not what she was saying she was saying this uh or i would say here's this thought process and she'd say, well, do you understand how wrong that thinking is? And I would say, I don't see anything wrong with it. But then she'd talk me through why. Clearly, it depends on the circumstances. Clearly, it depends on the individual. But for me, I think if it came down to a bottom line, it would be if the person started blaming you, the person with mental illness started blaming you and trying to hold you accountable for their health and or they were directing violence towards you. Mm. I still stick to my little checklist, which mm. is... Um, no, I like it. The person's commitment to getting better. Yeah. Well, that's got to be the first thing. It has to be because um, if, if there's a possibility that they can work on it and work towards being part of... Um, the family and being part of your life yeah. together, I think that's worth trying for. Yeah. Uh, I think about this, the the metaphor I think about is in World War II, the sailors stuck in the ocean. Um, sharks are around, it's dangerous. Um, one story in particular, there was three men in a boat. Two of them were willing to do anything to live so sharks would come up and they would try and kill those sharks and if they managed to kill one they would drink the blood they would eat it raw because they're in a raft but the other guy always wanted the easy way out let's surrender let's give up let's um just let me go and the guys would pull him up and they got to a point where they just went it, it, it broke them and gave them PTSD for the rest of their lives. But the only reason that they were able to survive is that they let this person go, let them choose their own fate. And yes, it devastated them, but they did what they had to do to stay alive. Mm. And that's why I don't think I would ever... Yes, I would have lost hope without you, and yes, it would have been harder to stay without you, but I would never be able to say, you know, you're being a jerk. What, why would you do that to somebody in my condition? It, it was like, okay, yeah, I can understand. Mm. She had to keep herself safe. All right, so obviously there's tons of different ways that we can go there check us out on youtube stp shattered the podcast we're on the instagrams we're on the facebook thank you for listening to shattered the podcast i'd like to thank our producer meredith brosnan our executive producer torian lau and the band adelaide for allowing us to use their song as our theme go to shatteredthepodcast.com for more information Thanks, everyone.
Subscribe, like, and share.